Hey guys, welcome to Life Groups. We are beginning a brand new series called Chosen. And in this series, we will be looking at the nation of Israel, the people that God chose in the Old Testament and the plans and the purposes that God had for them. So you might be asking, well, why should we care about Israel? Obviously, Israel is at the center of a lot of news today. Israel is in a war in the Middle East right now. And so you might think, oh, well, there's obvious relevance to us for the nation of Israel, but I want you to understand that Israel is relevant to us, not because it is still at the center of the news, but more importantly, because Israel's story is our story. See, tonight we're going to be focusing at the very beginning of how God called his people. God called the nation of Israel. And here's our main point for tonight. God calls his people as an act of restoring humanity back to their created purpose. God calls his people as an act of restoring humanity back to their created purpose. And so before we get into the lesson, I want you to take a few minutes and read a few uh, scripture passages and answer some questions with your group. So in order to understand Israel's story, we have to begin at the very beginning of the Bible. We have to begin in the garden. See, God created a world in which humanity lived in a land of abundance and blessing. Adam and Eve worshiped God and he dwelt with them. It says that he was walking in the garden. He was with his people. They were not separated from his presence. And these humans, Adam and Eve, were the pinnacles of his creation. In fact, paradise, the Garden of Eden, is like a magnificent living temple. When you look at ancient uh, documents of how ancient um, temples were described in, um, in some other cultures in the Middle East, we actually see parallels between those accounts and the Genesis account. And the idea is that God created the world, the earth, as his temple, a place where he dwells. And the people that he placed there were essentially the priests. And the image of their God was not on carved statues like it was in other temples, but it was on them. The the people themselves are the image of of God. So they lived in perfect obedience and unity with God, and they were told to be fruitful and to multiply. And this is God's purpose for the world, for creation, for us. So we get this grand image of what true humanity is supposed to look like, what the potential for humanity could be as God purposed it. And yet, the people chose to sin. They disobeyed and they were taken out of paradise. And they had a curse that was put upon them. They were removed from God's presence and along with it, they were removed from God's blessing. God's presence and his blessing are synonymous. They they go together. And so... The whole narrative of the Old Testament and the entire Bible is how can this purpose of humanity actually find its fulfillment? How can we come back to this place of perfection and wholeness? How can it be brought about once again? And we see the hope in the story of uh, the creation of Adam and Eve in this account In Genesis 3.15, we see that the hope will come through the offspring, the seed of the woman. 
that this offspring will eventually crush the head of the serpent. That's the, that's the word that's used there. That he will crush the head of the serpent. The serpent will try to crush his heel, will bite his heel. But a serpent's bite on the heel is far less powerful than the man's crush, crushing foot on the head of the serpent. And essentially, this struggle that will happen between the serpent's offspring and the woman's offspring will continue until it is complete with the serpent being crushed essentially undoing the curse that the serpent helped to bring about. That is the beginning of God calling his people. And we have to begin there. That he's going to undo the curse and he's going to bring humanity back to his purposes in the garden. And so how will this happen exactly? Well, it has to start somewhere. It has to start with someone. And so God simply chooses people based on his grace, to bring this restoration about. These people, of course, were not perfect. You can look at all of the people from the Old Testament. Not a single one was perfect. It's all God's grace, all God's work. But in his calling throughout the Old Testament, God is trying to restore his purposes for humanity. That's what it's all about. We see this played out powerfully in the calling of Abraham. If you look right before this story, right before the story of Abraham, you'll notice that it's the Tower of Babel. And it says that the the Lord scattered the people over the face of the whole earth. That's what happens right before God calls Abraham. And it makes us recall some interesting language from the beginning of the book of Genesis. That over the whole face of the earth... Right? We see that language right in Genesis 1. We see that there is chaos, that the world is, is um, unformed and is void, that there's waters across the face of the earth. And this is this idea of chaos. And what does God do at the beginning of Genesis? He speaks and he begins to order the chaos. And here... In Genesis 12, when there's chaos and the people are spread across the earth, we see that in Genesis 12, verse 1, it says, The Lord had said to Abraham. And so God speaks order into the chaos. And he says to Abraham, Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And what I want us to see from this is that in God's calling of Abraham, what he's doing is he's calling us back. He's calling humanity back to the garden. We see this in a few ways. The first, as I mentioned, is that God sends his word. It's a calling out of the chaos, just like at the beginning of Genesis. The second thing is that we see that there is this promised land of blessing. This correlates with the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis, this special land of blessing where God's people are to dwell. We see as well the call of being fruitful and multiplying. This is the language that was used in the beginning of Genesis when God first created man and woman. And now with Abraham, he's calling Abram to make him a great nation, to be fruitful and to multiply. And then finally, number four is the, we see the continuation of God's chosen offspring that are in conflict with Satan. And so Abram is in the midst of a a lot of pagan people, people who are opposed to the true God. And this continues the struggle that was predicted in Genesis 3.15. And we see from this point on in the Old Testament that God's people do multiply. They become the nation of Israel. And even when they become slaves in Egypt, God continues to send them his word and promise them a land of blessing where God himself 
will dwell with them. He continues to call them back to the garden. Eventually, Moses leads them out of Egypt and takes them just to the verge of the promised land. And there's such great hope for this renewed humanity, this new Adam that the people of Israel are supposed to be. And so we're going to stop here. And I want you to take a few minutes to discuss a few more questions with your group. So we see through this story in Exodus that just like with Abram in Genesis, God is calling humanity back to the garden. And again, we see some parallels. The first is that we see a contrast between obedience and disobedience. We we see a calling for people to be holy, to follow God and not to follow their own desires. You can look at Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, when God uh, presents to Adam and Eve the, the difference between, you know, being able to eat of any of the fruit in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He wants them to obey him. And then we see this again in Exodus uh, chapter 19, verse 5. The second thing is we see that God's people are his treasured possession. They're called the the priests. That in Exodus, God wants his people to be a holy nation, a nation of priests. And as I mentioned, this harkens back to the Genesis account where the people are essentially priests in the temple of the world. So God calls his people to holiness and perfect righteousness, and that through this righteousness, his people will enjoy the blessings of being with God. This is the narrative of the Old Testament. But as we will see in the weeks to come, this is a problem. Because the people God has chosen are too much like the old Adam. They're too much like the first humans. And so as we continue this series and we have discussions in Life Group, I hope that you will see that this story of Israel is not just true in a very literal way, it is, but also that the truth of this story transcends the bounds of history. See, it's a story of humanity. It's a story of you and me that God illustrated in a very real and tangible way through the nation of Israel, through his plans of restoring a people and yet a people that continue to fall far short of his standard. See, we all, all of us as humans, we all desire the garden. We all desire paradise. And God desires it for us. He wants us to live in this beautiful place, this beautiful world, this perfect world. But on our own, just like Israel, we are too much like the old Adam. We need a new and better one. We need a perfectly obedient Israel. We need a new humanity. And the good news is that that's who Jesus is for us. And so I hope that this lesson helps to make sense a little bit of the narrative of the Old Testament and God's calling of his people and what his desire is. And so I just want to let you know I am praying for you. I hope that you continue to have good discussion about this, that you'll continue to think about it. And I am looking forward to seeing you all soon.